Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Aspen Chabad Jewish Community Center. Uh, my name is Alan Altman. Uh, for Rabbi Mendel Mintz, he would like to welcome you all as well. Just a couple of announcements, just two, I promise, before we get the session started. Uh, two events coming up. On August 15th, next Thursday, Judicial Fortitude by Peter Wallison. Peter is a member of the American Enterprise Institute. He is well known throughout this country and internationally. And this is the subtitle of his new book, Judicial Fortitude, is the last chance to rein in the administrative state. And he is well positioned to write about this very important topic. That is at five o'clock next Thursday. There is no fee for this. It is free and open to the public, but please try and let the center here know that you are coming so we know how many people to plan for. That's on Thursday, August 15th. On Tuesday, August 20th, really our final event of the year, the rebirth of Jewish life in Poland and the ride for the living. This is the Krakow executive director of the JCC there, Jonathan Ornstein. He's gonna speak about the miraculous rebirth of Jewish life in Poland. So that is a fascinating and interesting uh, situation over there that he will enlighten us about. That's it for the announcements. I'm gonna hand over the microphone to Justin Lupau. Thank you, Alan. Good evening, and welcome to the Aspen Healthcare Summit. This is our second uh, Aspen Healthcare Summit, and with each year, the audience seems to be growing. Some of you may know, might already know me, but for those of you attending for your first time, my name is Justin Lupau, and I am the Chief of Staff of Gorland Companies. I would love nothing more than to stand up here for many more years to come. And without you guys, the community, that wouldn't be possible. I want to thank you for taking the time out of your evening to be here tonight. I know you will all enjoy tonight's discussion. I also want to take this time to thank Steve and Debbie Gorlin. They're, they're somewhere in here. They're hiding in the back, I'm sure. Um, the proud sponsors of, of this event. This is our way, the Gorlin Company's way, to give back to the community for everything that you guys have given to us. This event will always be free to the public. The only thing that I do ask is that you pay attention. Without the support of Steve and Debbie, this would not be possible. You have supported my vision, and I would like to thank you both from the bottom of my heart for standing beside me. I don't know where you guys are, but give them all a round of hand of applause. Every, every year we face new challenges, whether it be disease outbreaks, health epidemics like the opioid crisis, drug-resistant superbugs, or new innovations like the introduction to artificial intelligence in our healthcare systems. I try to stay up to date with these, I try to stay up to date with these cutting-edge issues that are going on in the world. Dr. Deborah Mash, Dr. Michael Mansour, and Dr. Peter Holland all caught my attention. And let me tell you, I'm beyond grateful that they are here today sharing their expertise and vision for the future of healthcare. Now, please let me bring Dr. Alan Altman back up and let's get the uh, conversation started. Thank you, Justin. You are all in for an incredible treat these next two hours. We have three incredible physician scientists who are going to enlighten you on three incredibly important topics. In order to hear these topics and focus on what you're hearing, I'm gonna ask you to please shut off your cell phones. We'll take a few minutes to let you do that. Also, a little bit of housekeeping. There are lavatories right out the door across the hall. I think more than that, we don't need to enlighten you. Our first speaker is quite special. 
Dr. Deborah Mash, Professor Emeritus of Neurology and Molecular and Cellular Pharmacology at the University of Miami uh, Miller School of Medicine. Now, my mother's maiden name was Miller, so I'm thinking maybe we have even more of a relationship. She is a neuroscientist, a pharmacologist, inventor, and an entrepreneur. I'm going to tell you her story because it's a little lengthy, but it is well worth hearing. Her laboratory research has been focused on psychiatric and degenerate diseases of the human brain. She's an expert in the study of the brain. She founded one of the largest biorepositories of postmortem brains donated after death to support discovery science for Alzheimer's and other dementias, drug and alcohol addiction, among other disorders of the human brain. This is a biorepository of brains. She started work in the field of addiction in the 90s when Miami, which was the place to be, was hit hard by the cocaine epidemic. Her National Institutes of Health funded research won her national recognition with the discovery of cocaethylene, a deadly cocaine metabolite that is formed when people drink and use cocaine at the same time. It was during this time that she first heard about the drug Ibogaine, a natural product medicine from Africa, 1992. She traveled to Amsterdam to see for herself the beneficial, albeit almost miraculous, effects of this drug in heroin and cocaine addicts seeking to break their drug habit. She decided while there to collect urine samples from these patients and brought them back to her university for testing. She and her team were credited with the discovery of an active metabolite of Ibogaine, which has opened a new direction for addiction drug therapy. She directs a team of academic and biotech researchers to help advance medications for opioid dependence. She believes that her work can help address the drug abuse crisis that we are experiencing in America today. I also hope and kind of know that she will address briefly and then more in your questions, the impact of marijuana on young brains and the long-term potential impact this being because on every street corner in our town, we have another store selling recreational marijuana. Albeit how you may feel about that one way or the other, let's put some science to it as well. So please warmly welcome Dr. Deborah Mush. Thank you very much. Um, it's indeed a pleasure to be here. Justin uh, Lupau, thank you for inviting me. And the Gorland companies I want to acknowledge, and also this very special place that I'm in right now giving this talk that I feel very, very passionate about. Um, so in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to share a story with you uh, that has been a, a, a very long journey for me and um, one that I hope to be able to report in the next few years some uh, very good progress. Um, by way of acknowledging conflict of interest, um, the research I'm presenting today has been supported by the NIH and also by um, many wonderful people who have given charitable contributions to the research. And also, I am the CEO and founder of a company called Demorex. And I will be talking a little bit about the work that we're doing there as well. So everyone in this room knows about America's heroin and prescription drug epidemic. But did you know that Americans consume 80% of the world's opiates? We love our drugs. And why is it that people become addicted to drugs, right? That's the kind of the big, the big question. And that's what neuroscience has been trying to understand for now several, many decades, actually. And we're beginning to unravel some of, some of the key aspects of this, but there's a lot more to learn. And time is running out. And I'm going to talk about this at the end, because this crisis can really, can really hurt 
so many Americans, but it also can help unravel the fabric. And this is in the context also of the current marijuana epidemic that we're going to see in many of our communities. So we have to begin to understand this, and we have to manage this and learn about this and teach young people about this. People abuse drugs because they're addictive. And when they become addicted, they develop a compulsive pattern of use. So you can't just say no to them anymore because the brain is fundamentally changed. And they continue to use them to despite the consequences. So you can have, you can lose everything, you can lose your home, your family, your loved ones, your money, and you keep going out and using drugs. You can go to jail, you go into jail, you come out of jail, you become entrenched in this pattern of addictive behavior. And opioids, what they do, like other drugs, and all abused drugs act on the same neurochemical circuit in the brain. They hijack the brain's reward. So everybody in this room has natural rewards. We love what we do. We love our work. We love our families. We get up in the morning. We feel good about what we do. We get up and go. Drugs hijack natural reinforcement in our lives. They just fundamentally take over that part of the brain. And when you use drugs, like opioids, for a long time, you develop a tolerance. So you need to take more and more and more and more. And that's where you start doctor shopping, right? You go from doctor to doctor. Instead of getting 30, 60, 90 pills, now you're up to 180 pills a month. And we're paying for that because that's being turned into our health care, to our insurance providers. And we're all paying for this. So when your brain is exposed to opioids, it has fundamental changes. Not only does it hijack reward, but it actually restructures the synaptic activity of the brain. And as everyone also knows in this room, people are dying. In fact, opioid intoxication deaths are now the number one cause of death of people under the age of 50. Think of that. And the numbers are increasing. So there's a loss of productivity in our society. There's a cost in our healthcare system. And people are dying, and it's disrupting families. The numbers you see on the slide here go up to 2015. The CDC numbers show that this is continuing to rise. And most of these deaths are due to heroin intoxication, but not always because it could be heroin with prescription drugs. And also, you've heard about the fentanyl and all the high-potency fentanyl and carfentanyl that's being flooded into the United States, being produced where? China. China. Exactly. So these fundamental changes in the brain, what happens is it actually causes the memory of the high. And people who are trying to break out of the cycle of addiction say, Dr. Mash, I'm chasing the memory of the high. That first line of cocaine, that first shot of heroin, it was so intensely pleasurable, I want to go back and experience that. But actually, as the brain neuro adapts and you get changes, not only at the level of the chemistry of the brain, but also at the DNA. Drugs hack the DNA. They change your DNA in your cells. And you can imagine that you have a mother or a father who then has a child, and they themselves have been abusing drugs, that those changes are encoded in the DNA, and it's handed down epigenetically. Okay, Not only for mothers that give birth to babies that are exposed in utero, but it's right in the DNA. This is handed down. You know, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, it says, the sons inherit the sins of the father. That's epigenetics. Get it? So we have been working with our colleagues. This is a multi-center NIH study to actually understand the epigenetic changes that are occurring in the brain. I'm very proud to be part of this study. There are the scientists at the Icon School in New York, RTI, multi-center um, study that is ongoing, Case Western University. And we're actually looking at postmortem brains. That's the logo of the brain biorepository that I, st I started and founded and developed. And um, we're trying to understand and look in the brain to identify new molecular targets so we can come up with a cure. That's going to take a long time. What can we do today? What's out there today? What do we do right now? Well, what we do right now is 
we're trying to deal with this growing crisis with the medication-assisted therapies of methadone. Does anybody know where methadone came from? Who synthesized methadone? Anybody? German doctors. Okay. When the, when the opium supply was cut off in the war to keep the Aryan war machine going, they synthesized methadone. And methadone comes into the United States through Rockefeller University. All right? Methadone is still an important drug, and many people have been helped by it. Buprenorphine, or Suboxone, is now the big ticket. And this is increasing, and many people are being transitioned from illicit or prescription opioids from their Oxycontin or their heroin on to Suboxone. And when I started um, working a few years ago with the company, Suboxone sales in the United States were $200 million. Today, they are $1.7 billion and growing. So we are putting more people transitioning onto Suboxone. Now, this has a lot of benefits, but also they are addicting. So it's not dealing with the acquired disease of addiction. It is what is called a substitution therapy. And people who try to come off of Suboxone, who want to transition to sobriety, want to break out of the cycle of addiction, have a very difficult time to do so. So really developing alternative medicines for addiction is an unmet need. Now, why is it so hard to get off of these opiates? Well, they bind, you know, our brain makes its own opiate, right? We have opiates in our brain. And so they're binding to the same receptors in the brain where the endogenous opioids act. So we have, we have our own mechanism for pain in our own brain. The buprenorphine or the suboxone is, was advanced to be less euphoric, so less addicting, in other words. And also, it would have lower chance for misuse. So you could stabilize people. They could become productive in society and do well. And that is our best hope. We, wanna, we want to believe that that is the way it works. I'm not sure that when we complete this over the next five to 10 years that we're going to learn that that is indeed the case because they are diverted, because they are abused, and because people go out and when they get in trouble, they go on to Suboxone, they get higher and higher doses of Suboxone, and then when they get a little bit of money or a little bit of stability, what do they do? They taper off their Suboxone, they go back on their heroin, and they get back into trouble again, and then they're back in the clinic again, going back on Suboxone. So you see this is a revolving cycle. We want to break the cycle of addiction. How do we do it? All right. So in, the, in sort of the culture, the underground culture, people are trying to come up. Addicts are trying, heroin addicts and legitimate pain patients too, are trying to come up with ways to deal with this because a lot of the doctors are cutting off the prescriptions now, right? So there is acupuncture that has been used. And it may be good after your detox from opioids to help. I think it is actually a good, a good thing. Kratom, you may have heard of Kratom. I am totally anti-Kratom. Kratom bars are opening up all over the place, and young people are going in there, and they're getting these drinks of Kratom. It comes from Thailand. It is an opiate. It is, a, it is abused. It is addicting, and it needs to be regulated. It is bad. And by the way, they're lacing it with fentanyl. Yes, Florida, all over the place. Um, Medical marijuana, people are talking about this. They're talking about medical marijuana after you're detoxed to transition and harm reduction. Now, is this a good idea? All right? Is this a good idea? There is anecdotal evidence that medical marijuana may be effective. There is data that's coming out, and people are talking about this. I don't, I don't feel that this is going to be the correct answer, and I don't think there's enough science here. But I'm worried about it because, why? Because chronic marijuana use causes a withdrawal syndrome. People who take high doses of marijuana, whether they're smoking it or they're ingesting it in gummy bears or whatever, when they take it, take it, take it, take it, take it, and you go off of it, you're going to experience a withdrawal. And they've done this, they've done this experiment in animals where they've taken animals that were opioid dependent and they've put them into withdrawal, 
with naltrexone, and you can take, do the same experiment where you use a cannabinoid one receptor antagonist and you can put the animals into withdrawal. What that says and what we already know scientifically is on the bottom of the slide is that the brain's own endocannabinoids, because we make our own cannabinoids in our brain. That's why we have can cannabinoid receptors in our brain, just like we have opioid receptors. These crosstalk. So that's going to set people up, I believe, for relapse. So I worry about that. That's something I worry about. So what about withdrawal? Patients will tell us that they fear withdrawal. And the problem with opiates or heroin is that they're short-acting. So when you use heroin or some of the short-acting prescription opiates, you're going through cycles of withdrawal. Okay? You get high, then it wears off, then you go through withdrawal, you've got to get high again, get high again, and get high again. And what that does is it makes a state of conditioned withdrawal. So even when you detox, that withdrawal signal is in the brain. So when you go through the withdrawal, it's a bad thing for the brain. We don't want people to experience very severe withdrawal syndrome. And when you come off of the opiates, you can get through the acute withdrawal, the fever, the chills, the anxiety, the diarrhea, the depression, the vomiting, et cetera, the nausea. But then you have what is called the post-acute withdrawal, which is the anxiety, the depression, and the craving. I, I, I feel bad. I feel bad. I feel bad. I know what would make me feel good if I just did one more, one more hit of heroin, if I did one more line of coke, I would feel better. And that's right there. So I learned about a medicine that was being used in an underground railroad of addicts helping addicts called ibogaine. I-B-O-G-I-N-E. And I published a paper in 2018 on the data and the results from work that we did, both in an FDA study as well as in an offshore clinical study that I was the director of. And this is the publication here. But Ibogaine has a long history. Ibogaine is a drug that comes from Tabernanthi Iboga in the the, the rainforest of Africa and the region of Gabon and Cameroon, and there's over 100 years of ethnopharmacology and ethnobotany behind this. Sibagaygi actually worked with this, was developing this as a medication back when, before the development of pharmaceuticals, when everything was natural product. When you think about the addicting opioids, what are they? They're opium, cocaine, Mother Nature's addicting alkaloids, nicotine. Well, here's something from Mother Nature that's an indole alkaloid that appears to be an antidote. And this is a little bit about the history. Ibogaine was actually marketed in France under the trade name Lambrine for over 30 years. And there was a young man who was a filmmaker in New York, Howard Lutzoff, and Mr. Lutzoff was a heroin addict. And in the 60s, he took a dose of Ibogaine just to get high. Somebody had it back when people were using LSD and other things in the 60s. And what he discovered is he was detoxed and he wasn't craving. And he repeated that experiment with seven of his friends. Some were cocaine freebasers, some were heroin addicts. And they had the same experience. That went, stayed in the underground for a long time until 1985 when Lutza started a company called NDA International. And he filed, got five patents, one for o opiates, psychostimulants, alcohol, nicotine, and polydrug dependence. Today, there are underground Ibogaine clinics in many parts of the world, and Americans are leaving to go offshore to get Ibogaine. But in 1993, I went to the FDA and I asked for permission to test in, a, in an academic medical center. And I got, I got permission. We got permission at the University of Miami. We were all ready to go. And what happened was we couldn't fund it. We couldn't fund it. And I couldn't get NIH funding. And I've had NIH funding for 32 years, so I know how to write a grant. All right? Couldn't get NIH funding for this. And Suboxone buprenorphine was on its way at the same time that we were working on Ibogaine. So that was kind of disappointing. So I did something um, a little maverick, and I went offshore. And I put together a team of people, and we collected data. And this slide is a little bit of a, a scientific slide, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. You heard about the discovery of the active metabolite. Well, 
Ibogaine is cleared from the blood very quickly. So we take a single dose of Ibogaine. This is oral Ibogaine. It's a single dose. It's cleared from the blood within 24 hours. But the noribogaine, the metabolite, you see the green line there, is elevated. So it stays in the blood. And we can even detect noribogaine in the urine at three weeks. So I thought, hmm, this might be what's happening. So we did this study. I had already seen this and knew this was the case, and seeing is believing, of course. But we did this study with medical doctors and a whole team of ther therapists and toxicologists and whatnot. And basically, we repeated Howard Letzoff's discovery, which demonstrated Ibogaine is a very gentle and effective detox. But not only is it effective detox for the acute withdrawal, but it also has long-lasting effects on depression and anxiety. And that's the post-acute withdrawal. And that's really important because the cravings and the desire to go out and get high again because you feel so bad in the weeks to months after you detox. It takes a long time for the brain to get back to baseline. You with me? So that's what's triggering that relapse. And people relapse. Relapse rates are how high? They're very high. Okay? You're lucky if 10% of people are clean at one year after they go into into detox and rehabilitation. So we looked at craving, and we looked across different modalities of craving. And this study here is looking at negative moods. So this would be depression, desire and intent to use. I'll feel good if I go out and get high. I, I don't know that I can ever really quit. I'm an addict. I'm never going to quit. And then expected positive benefits. And what we showed that, that I began had a, a beneficial effect across all four domains of craving in opiate-dependent patients. So that was exciting. And again, in the bottom of the slide there, remember I talked about the memory of the high, and, and the patients would tell us, I, I don't want to get high. I'm not thinking about going out and getting high. I'm not thinking about going out and getting high. So how does it work? Well, it's as if the Ibogaine plus the nor Ibogaine is kind of a one-two punch on the nervous system, resetting the addiction circuit in the brain. And I'm not going to go into the chemistry of this. It's very interesting. My colleagues would understand it. But the point is that it's not just acting on one single target. It's not a substitution therapy. It's modulating an entire circuit. And when you think about the acquired disease of addiction, it's a complicated disorder because you're not only, remember I told you, hijacking reward. If you take people off of drugs, they got to replace it with something else that makes them feel human. You got to get back into loving life again, loving your family, loving learning, loving God. You know, you got to put something back in to the mix. You've got to feel good. You can't have depression triggering you, and you, you have to reset the tolerance. And it's as if this combination does this. And that's why we see these very profound effects on not only the withdrawal, but also the craving and the harm reduction in terms of relapse. So we're very excited about that. The noribogaine is a new chemical entity. It's a new molecule. Um, we're developing it for um, various indications, which I won't talk about. But right now, 50% of, in many cities, 50% of our incarcerated People are opioid dependent, and they're going through withdrawals in jail. And it's, that's not humane. So we are looking also at developing a noribogaine, which is not an opioid, to help to treat the withdrawals of incarcerated addicts, which would be humane and also help get them ready for release and maybe reentry back into society. Wouldn't that be great? We have a global epidemic. It's not just an American problem. It's increasing in Europe. It's very bad in Canada. You know what's going on in Vancouver and, and, and the western part of Canada, but also in Toronto and other places. It's very bad. Opioid substitution therapies are important. They're part of medication-assisted therapies. We're grateful to the physicians and doctors who work with them. But what we're trying to do is to develop a true transition to abstinence-based therapy. That's what's needed, and that's what we believe we can do. The Ibogaine is an interesting molecule because it is also a psychotropic drug, and it is, can be used to give people insight into their addictive behaviors. 
and this is the controversial aspect of the Ibogaine, but many of my therapists and counselors believe it's an important piece of this because people gain insights into their self-destructive behaviors. And we did this elicitation narrative where our therapists uh, did a structured assessment and the patients felt 91% reported that they were given insight, that it was useful for drugs, that they felt the need to become sober abstinent, that they had a cleansed rebirth, second chance of life, and they had increased self-confidence, and they felt that they would be, meant, some of them reported that they were gonna die if they kept this up. So again, this is important. Now, why is this interesting? Because those of us who understand the importance of behavioral therapy, you know, we all listen to our messages, right? We all tell ourselves things. You can do it, get up, go. You're gonna make it, you can do it, win it, get out there. They need to hear this because neurons that fire, that fire together, wire together. And yes, you can engage the frontal lobes and you can modify, and this will be a very effective tool potentially for addiction rehabilitation. Bring people back into the society and know we're not gonna, we're not gonna help everybody. But if we can take 20, 30% of our people and bring them back in and get them off of drugs, and we've done it, we've seen it. We need to do the big experiment and prove it. Um, I only have a couple more slides. I began, I mentioned this has been a long journey for me, 1993, FDA permission, 1995, full FDA permission, and I'm standing up here talking about this, and we're filing with the FDA the end of this month to get this accelerated in the U.S., and we're going to be filing in, in Canada as well. All right, I'm, I'm putting everything I have into this. I retired from the University of Miami because I have to finish what I started. It's time. And there's another drug that has had a similar rocky road, which is lithium, okay? Lithium, very effective for bipolar mania. They knew about it in 1949. It took him 21 years to get FDA approval for this. All right, why? because he didn't have a commercial sponsor, okay? Drug, drug trials are expensive, they're hard to do. But I have another idea, that sometimes you just have to be a little maverick. And you may have heard about the patient's right to try. Have you heard about this at all? Well, let me, what if I told you that right now, there are a lot of people doing the Ibogaine experiment themselves. It says 85 Navy SEALs, no, the number's 100 Navy SEALs have gone offshore to take Ibogaine in Mexico, and they are saying that it is helping them, not only it's helping them with their PTSD, their TBI, their traumatic brain injury, and their self-medication with drugs and alcohol. The FDA gives them a cocktail of many medications. One of the young men who actually took Ibogaine, not with me, but in, in an offshore clinic, was on the Osama bin Laden raid. So they're carrying this information back into the military. We're gonna to look towards going towards expanded access for Ibogaine. The Food and Drug Administration allows companies to do this outside of clinical trials. And the way that you do this is that you have to have a rationale. Usually it's done for oncology drugs, but addiction is a life-threatening illness, just like certain cancers. And given the cost, societal costs to our country, I believe the time is now. Um, we can do this. Demerex has the drug supply. We're ready to go. We have the clinicians and the experts to help patients seek this. And I believe that what's going to happen when the FDA gives us the green light to go forward in the United States, the families are going to be calling the FDA saying, I want this now for my son, my daughter, my husband, my brother, my sister. And I believe that Demerex should be ready to do this. This may be a way to help treat the current drug abuse epidemic in America. It may be one tool in the toolbox, and the answers can't come fast enough because we know that this crisis is expensive. It's harming America. It's harming employers. It's harming the workplace. It's disrupting families. Families are losing their retirement funds, trying to save their loved ones. Indivior, the largest supplier of Suboxone, was called in for 
fraudulently marketing prescription opioids, the same game that Purdue did. And China, as I mentioned, is poisoning our, our shores. Thank you. No? Have a seat, please. Oh, well then why do I have to hang on to this? That's why, because you weren't at lunch. <laughs> what we're going to do is have each speaker give their short piece, and then we're going to have the three of them up here at once. So remember your questions, and not only will each speaker answer your questions, but we'll have the other speakers com uh, uh, commenting as well. Okay, so our next speaker, I want to invite Dr. Michael Mansour, who comes from my old neck of the woods in Boston at a place called Harvard. He is assistant professor of medicine, assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, and a transplant infectious disease attending at the Division of Infectious Disease at MGH, man's greatest hospital, I'm sorry, Massachusetts General Hospital. <laughs> I was at the Brigham, so we, we didn't get along, but in any case, um, he is truly one of the world's expert on fungal infectious disease, fungi. Uh, he's focused mainly on the care of solid and bone marrow transplant patients with infectious complications because those patients are on medications that lower their immune response. He maintains a basic research laboratory investigating the critical molecular mechanisms response for host immune responses to the life-threatening fungal infections. He's a unique physician, and I think as younger physicians come into uh, the practice world and the research world, they could take very good direction from Dr. Mansour. Dr. Mansour is dedicated to his patients, as many physicians are, but he's a researcher, and he takes what he learns from his patients to the research laboratory, and he is very dedicated to that. He is going to talk to us about superbugs. Would you kindly welcome Dr. Michael Mansour? Thank you. Excellent. Well, let me, let me start off by saying thank you to, to Justin, uh, the Gorlin companies for um, allowing me to speak to you today. I'm very honored uh, to tell you a little bit about my world. Uh, my big shoes to fill after that amazing talk. We're going to switch gears a little bit to bugs, okay? So um, I'm going to tell you some things that don't, I don't intend to be an alarmist uh, because I'm going to end with solutions, and I hope through the discussion uh, in the, at the end of uh, our panel session, we can really discuss this more openly. Okay, I have my disclosures up here, and I, I just need to point out number five, where I will be telling you a little bit about some technology we've developed around cellular therapy, these neutrophil therapeutics. I'm also a co-founder of Smart Farm Therapeutics, and I'm really proud to see our CEO, Jose Trabajo, here in the audience, who was a speaker last year at this very event. So I'm very, very proud to continue this tradition. Um, I have three points. I have 20 minutes. I have three points. I would quickly like to tell you and give you an overview about what it means to be drug resistant. You know, what does, what does that term mean? It's thrown around a lot. I'm going to tell you about a brand new epidemic that's occurring. It's called Candida auris, and has anyone heard of Candida auris just by show of hands? Great. So maybe about 40% half the audience has maybe heard the term. So 
let, I'd like to introduce Canada Ores to you, and then just talk very briefly at the end about three small stories, opportunities for intervention. Okay, so what is a drug-resistant pathogen? What do we mean by that? And so first, let me just say that can be a bacteria. It can be a fungus, which is what I really love to study. It can be a virus, and even can be a parasite. These are all pathogens, meaning these organisms can infect us, and they can be resistant, by definition, to one or more drugs, and therefore we can term them a drug-resistant pathogen. So these are career-building sort of um, um, uh, research avenues to, de to discover all of these and really understand them, and I've clearly chosen to work with fungi. Um, so I'm going to kind of put a question up on some of these slides, which I'm predicting is something you may be thinking about. So first question that you may be thinking about, is this really a problem that you need to care about? The answer is yes, and the reasons are that one, these drug-resistant pathogens are everywhere. The rates are rising rapidly, okay? You may have heard of some of these common ones. MRSA, methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, VRE, vancomycin-resistant Enterococcus, and a whole bunch of gram-negative bacteria like E. coli that are be becoming more and more resistant to all our antimicrobials. Uh, there's lots of studies. I'm showing you a figure from one study that's now projecting, based on current measured rates of resistance, what the impact will be of drug-resistant pathogens. And in this study, the size of the circle gives you the, the power of the impact. And if you look at the upper right one, it says AMR, antimicrobial resistance, and it's projecting that in 2050, it goes from that tiny green dot to like the light green large dot, and the prediction is it'll become the number one cause of death in the world. It'll surpass cancer, diabetes, um, accidents, um, many other things. So w that's where we're heading based on very careful mathematical modeling of rates of resistance to all our antibiotics and antifungals. So we really do need to care about this, and we need to make sure we, are, we can come off this path. So how do we be come into contact with, with these very scary bugs? Um, and maybe folks in this room are saying, this doesn't happen to me because that's stuff that happens to really ill individuals. So I can't encompass everything, but let's go through some of these. How do we, do, how do we uh, come into contact with them? So the first thing I need to tell you is that it's very easy. You know, it's, it's simply by contact. A lot of these reside on our skin. And so when we come into direct contact with individuals who may have some of these bacteria on their skin, they can be transmitted to you, and now they colonize your skin. Our food supply is filled with antibiotics, and so we're slowly feeding ourselves antibiotics and kind of breeding resistance. And so these, the organisms are found in our community. 30% um, of us in this room are colonized with MRSA. That's what, the, that's what the studies show. So if we swab all our skin in the room and we test it for MRSA, thir a third of us will be colonized with MRSA. Antibiotic use, as I mentioned, is very common in our food, but it's also common in our prescription habits as healthcare providers. So a lot of us will go with a cold, a sinus infection, feeling a little bit unwell, and if we admit this to each other, a lot of us expect to walk out with a prescription for antibiotics because maybe we feel... I must, I must take something to feel better. Lo and behold, what we've really been doing all these years is breeding resistance. So we are, we're um, allowing these bacteria exposure to these drugs so they can work their way around them and become resistant. We also need to worry about our growing population of weakened immunity patients. So what do I mean by that? That's someone with advanced diabetes. While we're better at treating this, someone who has diabetes has a weakened immune system. So they're unable to fight off the MRSA on their skin, and it becomes an opportunistic, opportunistic infection and really causes bigger problems. Patients I see a lot of are patients who have cancer, of leukemia, who have undergone a bone marrow transplant or a solid organ transplant. As, as Alan mentioned, these, um, they, they take medications that weaken their immune response. Um, People have a lot of autoimmune diseases. Many in the room may have rheumatoid arthritis, which is a very common autoimmune disease. You may take steroids and other biologics to weaken that immunity for, for symptom relief, 
but it also leaves you and with that double-edged sword being weakened to respond to uh, infection. Advanced age, and then being in high sort of endemic environments like nursing homes where a lot of these infections may congregate, you really get a hyper sort of transmission pattern. Uh, so really, from this one slide, you can see that it's really this, this um, weakened immune population is rising. It's our fastest rising population at, at MGH. Um, we're building two new buildings, and I can tell you they're all devoted to addressing the weakened immune patient. It's for more chemotherapy, it's for more transplantation, and they have a lot of good benefit. I, I, want, I want people to get chemotherapy when they have cancer because I want them to enjoy their life. We're left with someone who has a weakened immune system and we must mitigate those additional burdens now. So I'm going to give you just conclusions as I go through each section, and I'm going to say that antimicrobial resistance is on the rise. Um, it is projected to surpass and become the leading cause of death um, in 2050 by these, by these mathematical models. And there's really multiple points that all of us come into contact with where we can really interact and become colonized, have these bacteria on us. So I'm going to take that general introduction and talk about as one story in a little more depth, and that's Canada Oris. So this is a current epidemic. It's actively ongoing and actively rising in, in rates. Um, and Canada Oris, or I'll call it C. Oris, um, is a fungus. So let me just back up and just do a couple slides on what, actually, what is a fungus, okay? And so we have six kingdoms in our world. Here are just some cartoon pictures of them. And so we're in the animal one. Uh, there's plants. Below the plants are bacteria like Staph aureus, E. coli, the bacteria that can cause urinary tract infections, etc. But in the upper right is our fungi. Okay, so fungi are their own kingdom. They're very similar to us in, ter in terms of cellular structure. And for a long time, they haven't caused any major problem to humans, except now we have a growing population of weakened immune patients, and now we're seeing fungi take the opportunity to, to, to infect. So some people may have these images for, about fungi, and, and they're true. These, are, these are absolutely fungal pathogens. And so when we see a mushroom cap in our lawn or come growing out of a tree or we enjoy it on a slice of pizza, these are the fruiting bodies. These are the sexual organs of a large mothership of fungus below the surface of the lawn or inside the tree, and they're actually disseminating spores, their, their progeny, their offspring, okay? And we are enjoying them for dinner, or they look very pretty. Many of these can't infect us because they can't tolerate our temperature. We're too hot for them. But there's a small group that can. Okay? And when they do that, they can cause a wide spectrum of disease. We may be familiar with toenail fungus, skin fungus, but the fungal infections I'm dealing with with my patients are deep, invasive fungal infections that have traveled to the brain, the liver, lungs. And so these are just a snapshot of images. The bottom left one is a, is a CT image, a CAT scan of someone's lungs, where that little inset box is showing a fungus just necrotizing, just kind of chewing up someone's lungs, and, and that, that happened to be a mold, which is a very common infection. So in a cartoon format, the fungal kingdom that can infect us comes in a, in a couple formats. One is you have these little spheres. These are single cells, and these cells will grow as single cells outside the body or inside the body. And the bottom of that list is Canada auris. So there's several examples of yeast that can infect us, and Canada auris is the newest on the block. Um, on the, all the way on the right are molds, like bread mold, and they grow as multicellular organisms, and they release spores. And we inhale those spores, and they germinate as molds in us. And then in the middle are dimorphics, and they can phase change between mold and yeast, depending where they find themselves. And so here are some pictures. This is a yeast. This is a photomicrograph of yeast, and they're just little balls growing next to each other. And they'll always be single individual spheres, whereas molds have these long structures, and these are cells end on end, like train tracks. And they, they will grow and kind of dissect and punch through tissue and necrotize that tissue, dissolve it. So where did this one new yeast, Canada Oris, come from? 
And it's really, it's been a mystery. And it's been amazing to study this, this organism. But it was discovered in 2009 in a Japanese elderly patient who had undergone a very simple ENT surgery. It was, a, it was an ear procedure. And the ear kept getting infected. And so they cultured it, and they saw that it was growing a yeast, candida. They had no idea what it was. Uh, and so um, they realized they have a brand new organism that had never been seen before. And because the Latin and anatomical terms for the ear is orum, oracle, they termed it Canada orus from the outer ear. This is a picture of Canada orus, and it's a, it's a yeast, single little spheres, ovoid spheres. And so when we studied this more, we realized that um, it really did resemble some other candida species. Here's a plate from candida orus growing in our medical microbiology lab at MGH. And it looks like a creamy growth on a fungal plate similar to candida glabrata, cruzii, and albicans. We then started to realize, once we knew of its existence, that it, it was spreading. And we saw that it started in Japan, in the Far East. We then detected it, and you can see the timeline across the top of the slide, in South Korea, India, South Africa, the Middle East, Venezuela, and finally in the United States. And at this point, it's been found on almost every country around the world, all in rising rates, okay? So the CDC in 2017 sounds an alarm and issues a warning for Canada Oris. Um, and they, we were beginning to see additional cases. This map, which is maintained actively on the CDC, tracks the numbers. And you can see a couple things. Many parts of the country, including where we are today, have never reported Canada Oris. It is probably coming, but as of today, it has not been reported. The epidemic seems to be in the US, the state of New York, and the state of Illinois. But it's, see, it's been seen in Texas, uh, California, um, and many other states, and the colors are changing. We no longer are seeing blank white states. Um, as time goes on, we're seeing that they're all colored in, and we're, and we're definitely seeing auras pop up. The reason we care is the inset box. Mortality in someone who is infected with candor auras can reach up to 90%. So the minute it causes that infection, unfortunately, this patient probably is not going to make it. So that was the first reason candle auras became a problem. It, it really causes serious death. The second problem, and this is a slide I borrowed from the CDC, is right off the bat, it's multi-drug resistant. That we have never seen in candida, any candida species. But from the first point of culturing and testing it, here are the three major antifungals that we have, and we only have these, and that's it. We have 86.7% res resistant to azoles right off the bat to polyenes, and we are barely hanging on with the echinocandins, and we now find many strains that are resistant to everything, completely everything, and there's nothing to offer these patients. So high mortality, multi-drug resistant. And then the next, the third and last issue with candor auris is that it sticks to surfaces. And so when a patient with auris in a hospital room needs to move out of that room, we went back in and swabbed um, the bedside table, the railings of the bed, the bathroom, and we grew candor auris. We disinfected the rooms, swabbed again, grew candida auris. We swabbed the ceiling tiles, it grew candida auris. It was spreading everywhere, and it would not, we could not decontaminate it. For, so for a while, we were really concerned, and this hit the New York Times, it was on CNN, the BBC, um, and these issues really became very prominent. It really became a, an issue for the, for, as a global epidemic. And then we started to see things like this. So in England, some hospitals had to shut down Cardiothoracic programs, like people coming in for elective uh, bypass surgeries for heart attacks, had to be diverted to other hospitals because they could not guarantee a clean room for the patients. So it was shutting down ICUs and hospitals and really causing a major problem. We now do know how to decontaminate a room with Canada Auris. So we at least have those procedures in place. I can't tell you they're perfect. It's really a combination of very harsh detergents, and can you really scrub every crevice on that bed rail? You know, I worry about that. So Canada Oris really ha is here to stay. It's on the rise, and it has major, major problems with it. So the take-home messages from this part 
is that the theory is you have a healthy individual. They are exposed to canned ores. Where is it hiding? No one knows. We have searched far and wide to understand where the reservoir is. How did it appear in 2009? Where was it before 2009? Um, we don't know the answer to that. But there's an exposure event, and it looks like it colonizes the skin. That individual then has a procedure, becomes ill, um, has, uh, allows an opportunity to occur, and an infection occurs, and at that point, we see the mortality rate really climb. Um, we think this happens over years, and we think it's accelerated when someone presents with a weakened immune system. And so now, instead of years, it's much shorter. And so you can walk into a room because you have a complication of diabetes, or you're here for your next round of chemotherapy, and the room was maybe occupied with someone who had canned ores. And so in those days, you are now colonized. And now that you're colonized, we see rapid progression to opportunity for infection. So in understanding this, we have an opportunity to present a couple areas where we can interrupt the process. So one is, let's think outside the box. You have an immune-weakened individual. Well, let's boost their immunity. Um, let's decolonize that individual. If we know they have canned auras, can we do a better job to remove that off that person? Canned auras only lives on the skin, nowhere else. So can I, can I just decolonize that person and break the cycle? And then we need better drugs. This is multi-drug resistant. We need better antifungals. Justin, talk to me. One minute. Done. <laughs> I, could, I could sense it. <laughs> so... So Candoris, in sum, is a new, is a new fungal um, global epidemic, very hard to remove off surfaces with a high rate of resistance and, unfortunately, an incredibly high mortality, the, the highest mortality we've measured so far. So in the 30 seconds I have left, I'm going to go through three quick stories, and they are very quick. Number one, these are all things I work on in my lab and I'm very passionate about and I'm happy to talk about later. One is we may not need to go back for the new drugs and think about new screening, and I think that should happen. But sometimes we have to go a little faster. So we have a new approach of taking old drugs and, and trying to understand clues from them. Here's one of those clues. We've taken biguanides. The most common biguanide is metformin. A lot of people in this room are on metformin for diabetes. Lo and behold, when we test it, metformin has activity against Canada auris. So this has given us a clue. Maybe we can use those biguanides and derive off them. Here's a photomicrograph. It's going gr to come, but in every quadrant is Canda oris by itself, voriconazole, one of the azoles by itself, metformin, and then the combination. And you can simply see that the colonies growing in the combination are tiny compared to the media by itself. So it really does have synergistic activity, and we've seen that over and over. The second intervention is decolonization, and I think this really would break the cycle. And we have a lot of exciting data. We're using activated light therapy. You can actually eliminate canned auris off the skin. And so the, this, this certain form of activated light can damage the yeast cell in several locations. And what we have seen is not only in canned auris, but other candida species, as well as bacteria, on the y-axis is just live candida. And as you go across the bars, you can really um, provide light therapy with some other adjunctive drugs, and you can see massive reductions, almost near sterilization, of, can of Canada auris um, and other Canada species. So this is a safe way that maybe we can just illuminate a person on the surface and break that cycle and decolonize them. And the third intervention is boosting that immune system. And that this is one I'm very passionate about. Why don't we just give back that individual functional, active, supercharged white blood cells? Why don't we all donate white blood cells, and just give it to that poor person who can't get rid of Canada auris. Well, one, we would love to collect those neutrophils. And neutrophils are the most common white blood cell, and they come packed with three or four amazing killing um, capacities. So a neutrophil comes able to do reactive oxygen species. It can eat bacteria. It can throw out these degradative enzymes and these nets that can trap. And so I wish I could collect neutrophils from all of us and donate them back. The problem is they only live for one day. And so, can't do it. Unlike uh, all of us donating red blood cells or platelets, which can be stored for a while, I cannot store your neutrophils. And so we've developed an engineered cellular neutrophil therapy where we can grow these neutrophils to unlimited numbers. And we can now 
give them back. Um, we've done this in, in mice. Here's a photomicrograph of these neutrophils attacking candida albicans. Um, but I'll just get to the punchline. And if the folks in the back can play this movie, here are two cages of mice, which we treat very humanely. And we're very thankful to be able to use this mouse model. But the top mice have no white blood cells and a lethal injection of candida albicans to mimic candidemia. The bottom mice, at the same time period, have been given cell therapy. And you can see that they're happy, they're exploring their cage. And when we look at their kidneys, which are a target in mice for candida, um, I won't go through all this, but you can see these big blooms on the right side of candida growing in their kidneys. But the ones treated with neutrophils are really shrunk, and they're, they're tiny. So my dream in the future is to take these neutrophil cell therapies, grow them up in an unlimited fashion, and give them to patients who need them. So these opportunities um, for intervention, one is the one we can repurpose drugs. We also need to screen for new ones. Uh, we have lots of good evidence that simple things like activated light could break the colonization cycle. And I can talk for two weeks about cell therapy. <laughs> but I'll stop here. I'll thank, I'll thank everyone, you, for your uh, attention. And I'll take questions at the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Mansoor. Didn't I tell you this was going to be incredible? This is very important stuff. Understand that each of the talks you're hearing could actually be a week conference, seven-day conference. We're just skimming the top of this. That's what's so fascinating about these topics. Our third speaker and last speaker, and again, I remind you, keep your questions in your mind, or if you have something to write, write them down. We will be discussing all of this in the question aspect of our talk here. Dr. Peter Hallen, a fascinating guy, past director of the National Intelligence as Office Director for Safe and Secure Operations, Intelligence Advanced Research Project, all that is ARPA, past program manager with the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, DARPA. Didn't DARPA invent the web or something? I mean, there's some rumors about this, this incredible agency. He served for 10 years on active duty in the United States Air Force, including five associate professor, five as associate professor of physics at the Air Force Institute of Technology, and he received all his degrees from Harvard, as one might expect. He's really quite fascinating because he looks for problems, and he looks for ways to solve these problems. And we're going to learn quite a bit about artificial intelligence. Being a gynecologist, I found myself during lunch with him saying artificial insemination, but it's really artificial intelligence. It has nothing to do with what I used to have to do with. So would you all give a warm welcome for Dr. Peter Holland. Thank you, Alan. You have the, there you go. But thanks, Alan, for that warm welcome. And thanks uh, to Steve and Debbie for inviting me to spend a little time with you today. So, I'm not a real doctor, as my wife says. I do the science piece, not the medical piece, so don't ask me for any prescription advice. What I'd like to talk to you about a little bit today is, is what everybody seems to be talking about, this artificial intelligence. And I'm going to try to address the question, is it artificial intelligence, or is it natural stupidity, or something in between? And so there are five questions that I'd like to address here. The first is, what is exactly artificial intelligence? We say AI this, AI that, and it's a little bit scary. What actually is it, and how does it work? Is it new? Or has it been around for a long time? It's just been called different things. Is it useful? And under what conditions might it be useful? And why is there all this buzz about artificial intelligence after all? Is this something that's really going to help us? Is it going to hurt us, or is it going to do something in between? So. Uh, Every year, the partners, people in Harvard Medical School put on this elaborate conference called AI in Healthcare. I went to this conference last year. There were about 1,500 attendees, and they were all excited about artificial intelligence. They came up with what they call the disruptive dozen. These are the things that 
the experts are advertising artificial intelligence is going to do for all of us. And I'm going to come back to these at the end. I just wanted to give you a preview of some of the claims that are being made about artificial intelligence and how it's going to change our lives going forward. So what actually is artificial intelligence? You can see these pictures on the left of your screens. And the basis for this is something called a neural network. And it sounds complicated, but the most important part of this actually happens off to the left on the screen, where you take a set of ideas and have to turn them into numbers. In some cases, that works very well. For example, if I want to take a little fragment of speech and measure a, a waveform of pressure as a function of time, that's something that can be measured very accurately, very reproducibly over and over again. On the other hand, if I take something like an electronic health record, how many of you can read your doctor's writing? Right? It's very complicated, and I could have the same actual condition, but half a dozen physicians would come to very different sets of observations about what's actually happening. So an important aspect of this math is essentially how good are you at taking whatever idea it is you have in your head and turning it into numbers. The second piece on, on this, under the simple neural network label there, so you, you're feeding in some kind of information, a bunch of numbers, and now that second layer does what our brain does. It takes those numbers in different combinations, and it can add them up. It can multiply them. It can do more complex mathematical operations. But the whole idea here is that you're just taking one set of numbers and turning it into a new set of numbers with a set of rules. And those rules are actually very flexible. And then there's a little bit of the hype which says, OK, a simple neural network is not enough. It has to be deep. And so to be deep, you just put more than one layer along the way. Now, why is that interesting? Well, because if I have something that I really don't understand, and I want to bin it into things, I can use this approach. And you can think about the neural network as a black box. So as an expert, I might take a series of mammograms. And I might say, I know these 500 mammograms have cancer spots on them. And these other 500 are clean. And so what I do is I feed these sets of numbers through my neural network, and I fiddle around with the coefficients and the number of layers and the shape until what comes out at the other end is two groups, cancer and no cancer. So conceptually, this is really just massaging numbers. And we can do this with a, with a one-dimensional sort of representation, like a sound waveform, where I might, for example, have Siri listen to the name Siri from 5,000 different people. And of course, we all sound a little bit different. But there are common features. And so we can use this approach to pick out those common features so that everybody, when they say Siri, gets a response. We can take this, too, and do it in more than one dimension. So if instead of having a sound waveform, I have an image of something. Again, it's all numbers. So that's pretty straightforward. And what this does is essentially provide a black box to bin things into categories. But of course, you have to do the training at the beginning. We have to have the oncologist or the radiologist in the front end tell us which of these things are bad and which are good. So, what I'm trying to leave you with here in this slide is there's no magic here. This is just math. Okay? So the second question I'd like to ask is, is this really new? And what I'm showing you on the left hand of the screen is a patent from 1963 that talks about neural information processing. It uses the word neural network. And in this case, you can see a circuit diagram there, which is figure two, which doesn't have any digital components. It's just resistors and um, and capacitors, thank you. Okay, It's just an analog computer, which is the way a lot of these things used to be done. So again, this is not terribly new. Now, you could ask, why is that interesting? And the amazing thing is that there's a, there's a very sim close similarity between these pictures of circuit diagrams on the one hand and the way the nerves in our brain work. And that's why it's called neuromorphic computing or neural networks. So you can have a whole series of different kinds of connections. And essentially, what our brain does, instead of transmitting electric currents the way we would in a circuit, you've got these synapses that are close together. And when they're activated, they spit out chemicals. And those chemicals bind at another site, and they trigger a polarization pulse. 
All that's very interesting, and you can imagine just a single wire making a connection, but now if you recognize that we have about 100 billion neurons in our brain, and each one can make up to, I don't know, 50,000 or so connections, there's an awful lot of tuning that goes into that neural network. And in fact, that's what makes us each individuals in part, is that the way we've shaped our neurons and connected them and how many layers we have, that determines how we see the world and how we process it. So we know that we're, for example, able to distinguish faces, really with amazing rapidity, at least some of us are, right? And so we're, we're kind of doing the same thing that these neural network systems are doing, but we actually do it better. Okay, so what I'd like to do is, is take a moment and illustrate. How many of you have ever played the game of Go? Anyone? Just a couple. It's not very common in the West, all right? So there's a very pretty paper in Nature in 2017 that describes this Go game. And at, at, at its most basic, it's a 19 by 19 element grid. There are two players with black stones and white stones, and they take turn putting the stones anywhere they like on the board. If you surround somebody of the different color, you get to pull all their stones off the board. And so the objective of the game is to acquire either the most area or the most stones, and some combination of those things. Now, the reason this is interesting is that it's a, very, it's a game with very simple rules, but a lot of different ways to play. And in fact, there's a fairly well-established ranking for professional Go players who may spend their whole lives doing this. It's called the um, Edo in Index. And so, essentially what's happening, as you see in this little three-part arc, we start off and, and you, you put some of these stones down, and at each stage of the game, your decision is, where do I put my next stone to give me the highest probability of winning the game? So it turns out that um, you could give this, we could, we could use the same neural network approach for playing the game of Go that I just described, where we take professional players, and we let a machine choose which move to make next, we do that over and over and over again, and eventually we train that neural network to have the same kind of responses on a probabilistic basis that the professional Go player has. So that's all very interesting. In fact, that's what these people in England did. And what they found is, after a relatively short period of time, they were able to make a, a neural network that beat all the living Go players and had a higher ranking. But what's really more interesting about this is that then they said, can we do something that a human being can't do? And, and the way they did that was to say, we're going to just give the computer the rules of the game of Go, which are fairly simple, and we know how to score, whether they win or lose or tie. And we're going to let the machine play itself. Now, if we were to play, it takes about an hour for a human to play a game of Go. So if we play for 12 hours a day for 60 years, we'd play about a quarter million games, which is prodigious, right? This computer played the game of Go 49 million times in about a week and a half with itself. And so as a result, you can see it would, it would be able to explore a much larger set of possibilities. And it was therefore able to beat the, both the human players and the machine that always beat the human players that was trained by humans all the time. All right, so this addresses an important point. Neural network technology can do things that human beings can't, but it's largely because it's much faster and it doesn't make the same kind of mistakes that we make. I imagine if I played Go even more than once a week, I would start making the same mistakes over and over again. So in a nutshell, that's how artificial, so-called artificial intelligence works. And there are variations on this theme, but essentially what it's doing is taking simple rules and either speeding up to explore a larger parameter space, or using human training to come to a conclusion. And now some of you may have heard about facial recognition. This is another example of artificial intelligence and how it can be good and can be bad. Again, we've got a, we've got a, a group of measurements of a human face, and you can see these dots, or you can describe them as trapezoids, what have you. But it's the same basic problem. We're going to feed this in, and now we're going to compare this gentleman's face with a library of other faces. And we're going to say, can we find him in that, in that cloud? And the answer is yes. So I can train the neural network to identify individuals from a previous record. 
and it does a pretty good job. But there's an important caveat here, and that is implicit bias, which I want to make everybody aware of. Okay? So because of the original facial recognition codes were mostly written by young Caucasian engineers, it did a pretty good job of getting young male Caucasians correctly. But it did a terrible job with Asian people or people from Africa. In fact, it did a much poorer job with women than it did with men, because that was the way the thing was trained. So in thinking about whether these things are actually better than people, we also have to ask the question, can it be unbiased? Should we accept the answer from the machine as the right answer because it comes from the machine? And I'd suggest the answer to that question is no. So the last sort of application of so-called artificial intelligence I'd like to share with you is natural language translation. And this has been around also for decades. At DARPA, this had been worked on for a very long time. And it's a hard problem. But as you can see from the chart here, there are variations in the quality of the results. So going from English to French and French to English, still the human does the best job. But the machines, using these pattern matching techniques, are getting slowly better and better. On the other hand, we have to always recognize that the quality of the results from these machine learning systems depends very importantly both on the quality of the stuff we use to train these things and sort of the internal structure of the black box. How many layers, how are they organized, and so forth. And you can see there's another little illustration on there which I used in talking to some real estate people where you want to maybe have a house appraisal. So you feed in these quantities, the number of bedrooms, um, how many square feet, what's the neighborhood like, and you come up with a valuation. Unfortunately, it doesn't capture any of the intuitive features that make a piece of property appealing or not, as those of you who are fortunate enough to live in Aspen will understand better than most, right? OK, so let's just talk for a moment about the state of artificial intelligence and what the perceptions of, are, the, perceptions of the larger community are out there. And, and this Vance and Bourne group did a survey of 260 large global corporations. And 80% of them said they were investing in artificial intelligence. Uh, when I went to this conference in uh, Boston, I had a mathematician friend with me who said, in order to understand what people are talking about here, as they're speaking, I swap out the word in my head. Instead of hearing AI, I put Ouija board. And if the answer seems pretty much the same, then I know I haven't learned anything. And unfortunately, my experience at this conference and having now looked at a lot of those papers is that, yeah, there's really not much there. All of these things that have to do with image analysis have been machine vision for decades. The natural language processing stuff has been around for a very long time. What's new is that it's faster, and that's great. And occasionally you can do things now much less expensively, although I should point out, I think that the computer system that was used to do the AlphaGo Zero problem cost about $29 million. So these computations are not free. They take electrical power, they take infrastructure, they take programmers to look after them. And so AI is not a solution to all of the world's problems, nor is it um, infallible. Anyway, the other thing about this which I found fascinating is that so many people are keen to do AI, but they don't seem to really understand what it is. If you ask them, what are you going to use this for? They say, well, I don't know. We're going to you know, use AI for something. So you can see the rest of those things. The other thing that I'll just call to your attention is that there's buzz out there because people are patenting the hell out of this stuff. So you know there are 20,000 issued US patents concerned with artificial intelligence. Everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. Whether that's helpful or not really remains to be seen. OK, so let's just take a moment to, to review some of these so-called disruptive dozen um, artificial intelligence opportunities and ask, are they really new? Are they feasible? Or is this just marketing jargon? Is this branding of this new idea for artificial intelligence? Well, we haven't really talked about melding of mind and machine. But I have to tell you, that's a stress. Because reading the mind is something we haven't managed to do. And there are so many neurons in there. Just making a connection of some kind is just hard to imagine. But I'm not going to say it's out of the question. On the other hand, it doesn't seem 
relevant to the black box of neural networks. What about next-gen radiology? Gee, that sounds exciting, right? It's just machine vision on steroids. Basically, all of these artificial intelligence systems do is an elaborate curve fitting process. I have some group of things over here. I want to see how they map to some group of things over there. And so I put this black box in the middle. And that sounds great, except that it doesn't tell you anything about the cause and effect relationship between what's happening. The physicians call this associations, right? You know, drinking cola is associated with cancer. Well, maybe yes or maybe no, but until you understand, as Michael was displaying, the mechanistic relationship, how A leads to B leads to C, you're really no better off. And I'd argue that's one of the challenges of artificial intelligence. You have this black box with millions of floating parameters and complex nonlinear functions. What do you learn by applying this, other than that you can bin things into a, a new way? Um, I like this one. Um, AI tools that help reduce physicians' computer use. All of my physicians and my physician friends hate sitting at the computer while they're supposed to be talking to a patient. I get that completely. But you have to ask, is the um, automated teller machine approach really going really to solve that, that problem? Yes, we could use natural language processing so that they could make their notes, but there are still going to be errors. And there's going to be bias based on the way that that artificial intelligence platform is trained. So, this could be very powerful in a real labor-saving device. However, we have to be aware that, that bias and errors, if we start off with input that's error-filled, incomplete, right, and, and, and inhomogeneous, we have to worry about what comes out the other end. So care is going to be required. Can personal devices improve your health? Well, there seems to be this implicit idea that more data are always better. But that's clearly not the case, because when you add more data, you add noise as well as signal. And we run the risk of making false associations where no cause and effect underlying thing is happening. And of course, there's AI at the bedside. Somehow we're all going to be, um, you know, I'm fairly skeptical about that. So as you look at these, at these topics where the industry, the healthcare industry is saying, wow, isn't this great? I'd urge an, a note of caution and say, gee, you know, this, maybe this can be helpful, but it's really not qualitatively different from what we're already doing with reading x-rays with machines, using um, Dragon Naturally Speaking in the doctor's office to help transcribe and remove some of the drudgery. And so finally, I'd just like to address this question about the buzz of artificial intelligence and, and should we be concerned about it? And so there's this, this artificial intelligence magazine, of course, and I'm, you can tell I'm a fairly skeptical man when it comes to branding. I like to just probe beneath the surface and ask, is this real? Do I want artificial intelligence doing automated customer support? I mean, how many of us have been stuck on the phone pressing one, pressing two, pressing three, and having to explain the same thing over and over to a machine that ends up just disconnecting us? One of the pernicious ways that artificial intelligence is being used right now is for marketing, right? Because there are all these subtle associations in the way we behave, what we buy, where we go, how we speak, how we dress. And those are being harvested by Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, to better understand how to get us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do, to buy something, to vote for someone, to go somewhere, to try something. And I'd argue that as much as we all say we can resist that temptation, these tools are incredibly sub subtle. It's, it's psychological warfare, which we are all voluntarily submitting ourselves to. And I think the only, the only protection against that is to try to be aware when this stuff is happening. OK, so let me just summarize and say that these artificial intelligence tools are really not that new. They're supercharged because we have cheap computers, large-scale databases, and lots of memory. They can be very helpful, and in fact, they can do things that humans can't do today because they're so much faster and because they don't make the same kinds of mistakes that we make as human beings. 
On the other hand, um, this idea of the black box is only going to get us to these associations or correlations. And I think what, as scientists and as medical doctors, what we want is those cause and effect relationships, which may be very different in different situations. So I think that these techniques are useful for identifying correlations, for, for sorting data using human training, where you can take some of the drudgery out of a, a job, let's say, by having this machine sort through things and put them into bins. That's great. Um, and they can find patterns that are elusive because you've got these enormous data sets of purchases. They can you know, identify patterns in epidemiology, for example, that would be very difficult for a human to do otherwise. And they can, they can look for outliers or anomalies, things that are not fitting into any pattern. And that also can be helpful. But these things do not, absolutely do not, establish causal relationships. And if somebody tells you otherwise, you should be very skeptical. They don't remove bias. So we have to be aware that when we make a machine to do something, whether it's a deep learning network or something else, that it's possible that there's bias built into that system, and we have to be on guard that that bias isn't going to just steer us in the wrong direction. These things really don't help when you have noisy, incomplete, or um, erroneous data. It's garbage in, garbage out, just like any computer program. And finally, which is really a sum of all those three previous points, these machines are not inherently accurate. They do what they're told, and that's all. And so that's what I'd like to leave with, and I think we're going to turn over to uh, questions. Thank you very much for your attention. We're just going to have the professionals come up, remove the podium. I'm going to ask all three speakers to please come up. We are going to open the floor to questions. Uh, I believe to get to 7 o'clock, we've got 25 minutes. I'm going to ask one or two questions, then we will open it to the floor. If all the speakers will come up, Deborah, you're going to get remiked. Good. She's good. Where has Re restroom Peter gone? Restroom. The restroom? Ah. I hope he doesn't have his active mic on. Okay. <laughs> Deborah, let's start with you. I mentioned before the concern about the impact of marijuana on teenage brains. We have numerous stores here where just about anyone can purchase uh, providing they're of age, but somehow these products, which are far more potent than what you and I may have been exposed to in our youth. Thank Notice you. I didn't say yep, I'm you, just, uh, what we used. Water is incompressible, right? I'm sorry? That's why you always take them off before you leave the room, you know? This there he is. Come on. There he is. We heard, we heard you in the Artificial room. Artificial pee, right? Oh, they heard me. Oh. <laughs> we heard everything. Oh, sorry about that. There was no problem. And what we know is in the men's room, there's a black box. Only kidding. So, Deborah, would you comment yeah, yes, with relatively quickly, so, short length on yes. your concerns yeah, about very, this? Very quick. So, um, marijuana exposure, cannabinoids exposure, and developing nervous system. Am I worried about it? You bet I am. Okay, because the brain um, doesn't, you know, when you're um, in adolescence to early adulthood is a big brain growth spurt. And it's very important because what happens to the brain is that the synapses that you heard about in this brilliant talk um, are being modeled, they're being remodeled, and they're being pruned, and they're being directed. By having the signaling, just slamming the, the brain with these uh, external cannabinoids, you're definitely going to change the neural landscape of the brain. Remember that serious mental illness like schizophrenia develops when? At the time of early adulthood, when you're in the late 
teens, early 20s is when you'll have first break schizophrenia. We know that the brain, we used to think that, you know, your nervous system was formed, you were born with your neurons, and then, you know, over time they died out and you lost neurons and that was part of aging. We now know that there's a lot of neurogenesis in the brain, which means the birth of new neurons, and some of these abused substances change that. So not only are you changing synaptic architecture, but you're also changing the way neurons are doing their business, the numbers of neurons that are being recruited to a brain area. So I'm very concerned about this. You know, it's one thing to have so-called recreational exposure. It's another thing to be using daily, high doses of very potent um, anything, be it alcohol or anything. But because the endocannabinoids are powerful, important signaling pathways in the brain, then yes, I think they may have, a, uh, we, we're gonna learn something about this. You know, a lot of this goes shrooming here in Aspen, which is collecting mushrooms. So how many shroomers do we have in the audience? There you go. Figured we get at least one. And the other thing we do a lot here is we go skiing and we ride bikes and we get orthopedic injuries. And it's something very fascinating I heard from a patient who just underwent a knee replacement. I said, where did you have it done? He said, I went to this hospital that was a specific orthopedic hospital. Because if you go to a general hospital, you got all those other bugs and you can get sick from and die. <laughs> Does this person have a point? That's really interesting. I, I, I wish they did, um, but there's really no way to predict this unless we, so the shrooming, you know, as long as you know what you're doing, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those that you can pick out there in nature do come with very powerful poisons. And so you just, you have to know what you're doing, you know, so please just stick to the supermarket <laughs> if you have no idea what you're doing. Um, from, from the healthcare perspective, Without active surveillance, and this, is, and this is an unmet need as well, without active surveillance, you just don't know. Um, you may have n no MRSA or canned auris or other resistant gram negatives on your skin in your GI tract um, last week. But lo and behold, you do this week because you've gone through an exposure. Nothing that would trigger you know, a memory of, I went to this place, I ate this food, I interacted with this individual you would have no way to know that. So without really active surveillance around the time of those procedures, which is where a lot of healthcare around orthopedic joint procedures is moving, um, you, you wouldn't really know. Now, there are people sitting in this audience who are going to ask you, so I'll ask for them. How do I get tested to see if I have this on my skin? And if I do, what do I do about it? Or should I not get tested? In other words, where does this lead us? Well, you know, I think the ignorance is bliss era is gone. So, you know, I think let's go with the most common drug-resistant bacteria. And today, that's MRSA, methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Um, it's been around for decades. It's never going to go away, um, as far as we can tell. That's a simple swab. And most hospitals nowadays, their basic protocol is you come into the hospital, you're being admitted. It's really now pretty common that they'll take out this sterile Q-tip and they'll swab the inside of your nose. They may swab your armpits. They may swab your groin, just the skin. And they'll send it to the lab and they'll say, can you grow and identify MRSA? on the end of this swab? And if the answer is yes, then what they'll do is they'll treat you a little bit differently. They'll know you require different antibiotics than someone who does not have MRSA. They'll also put you in a private room. They may wear gowns when they walk into the room to prevent transmission from this patient to the person who does not have MRSA. That's just one bug. You know, that's just one bug. Um, should we be doing that for many others, including canned auris, including maybe stool testing to see what kind of bacteria we have in our, in our gut. Um, the short answer is we probably should be. We just need to find the way to do that efficiently, um, do it and make it cost effective to, so that our healthcare can absorb that, um, that cost. And then I've, I'm leaving the last question, which is what do I do about that? And right now the, the only thing we do 
is that we have power of knowledge. And then I can go to that patient and say, please remember, you are colonized with MRSA. So if you come in with a skin infection or a boil, you please tell that physician that you have MRSA so they at least pre prescribe the correct antibiotic. It's a hell of a way to get a private room in a hospital. <laughs> <coughs> it is. I'm not advocating lying about that to get a Peter, private room. What's the most overhyped aspect of artificial intelligence in medicine? Well, this is just an opinion, of course, but I think... You've got to hold it higher. There we go. Um, this is just my personal opinion, but I think this idea that we can take electronic health records, which are heterogeneous, incomplete, filled with errors, and measured with inconsistent standards, this idea that IBM Watson, for example, is going to revolutionize our health care by automating these things and finding patterns, I think that's a stretch. I think there's more hype there than there needs to be. There are some powerful things we can do with artificial intelligence, but sorting through electronic health records, I don't see that happening anytime soon because the data is so crummy to begin with. And uh, we kind of hope as physicians or physician scientists uh, to be able to still have a connection with patients. It's job security for you. Job guys. security, absolutely. Let's open up the floor to questions, please. This lady right here. Please take this. I noticed that you said something about being against uh, devices or not really believing in devices that you can use to get more information for yourself, but I noticed you are wearing two watches, and one of them looks like a, an eye watch or something that would monitor your steps or your heart rate or something like that. Now, that is a shortcut. My other question, very quickly, is I'm fascinated by Watson, and I have been saw in 60 Minutes that it absorbs thousands of medical papers in a, in a few hours. I mean, it, it gets all this information that no one human being could possibly read. Do they ask, is that, is Watson artificial intelligence? And do they ask Watson a question like, okay, now you have every bit of information available on cancer. What's the, what's the cure? And does the computer think, can it, can it, Make a, make a judgment on all that information. Okay, so that's... that's I told you people were going to ask that's about a, that's that. That's a two-part question. So the, the answer to your first question is, yes, I have a regular wristwatch and something called a whoop, and this monitors my pulse every second, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because I'm doing experiments on myself. So you don't need to wear one of these if you don't want to, but I'm curious about the connection between external behavior and heart rate variability to see whether there's something real there or whether it's mostly hype. For your second question, with respect to Watson, it's true that, that Watson can ingest large quantities of scientific literature. And the way it does this is something called linguistic semantic analysis, which essentially takes words and turns them into numbers in a fairly efficient way. It's not a perfect process but it does allow comparison of many different documents in a way that helps them summarize. So what you might expect from Watson if you say, what's the state of the art in renal cell carcinoma? It may come back and say, well, the most recent papers are these, and they come to the following conclusions from the end of their, you know, they just basically cut and paste things. Um, and some of the older work is this, or you could use this approach to say, how is, the attitude of the physician community as a whole concerning diagnosis and treatment of a particular disorder. How is that evolving over time? And I think there, there are opportunities. But expecting Watson to ingest, um, I mean, the intelligence community is doing something like this with, with um, foreign scientific literature. The scientific literature is vast, and it's filled with errors and inconsistencies. And what you'd like to be able to do is say, is there a consensus or not? And if there isn't, are there outliers that maybe are worth exploring? So I think it does have utility, but by itself, I don't think it's intelligent. It's not gonna ask the question. It's gonna summarize vast quantities of information to help you answer the question, or somebody else who's familiar with fungi or other, other conditions. Does that answer your question? I, 
Yeah, sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you've used Google, yes? Yes. Okay, so Google has an algorithm that when you ask it a question, it identifies in principle the, the best answer. But best, by their definition, in part depends on how much they can sell you, right? Mm. But it is, it's an artificial intelligence, it's a neural network, very high speed algorithm. And so you get a selection of, of results. And what I'm suggesting to you is that Watson is going to do something very similar. It's going to give you a selection of results. But as I was mentioning in the talk, there's intrinsic bias in the way that algorithm is programmed and in the quality of the information that flows into it. And it's not always true that lots more information is necessarily better. As somebody who reads lots of scientific papers, I can tell you I get burnout. Right, because sometimes they, you just can't make sense out of them. So, yeah. Michael, wanted to add. I, I just want to say one thing on this point. I will, I will admit this openly. When I get confused by a very hard case, okay, I'm, I'm looking at this patient and I'm like, I, I just, I don't know what is wrong with you. There's something wrong, and you're telling me that. Um, many of us will use all sorts of available softwares to help increase the number of possibilities? Am I, am I thinking about enough possibilities? So if I have 10 things that this could represent, this, you know, what's, what's number 50? Am I, am I in the rare, rare area? We'll Google stuff. We'll use anything we can get. In the end, none of those electronic networks are ever going to take over me putting my stethoscope on that patient listening to them, examining them, um, and really extracting all the variables as they tell me their story. And I mean, until I can do that, I, I think we're always going to be biased um, from, from these systems. I think it's called intuition. You need intuition. You do. Next question. And you'd caring. Please. Uh, right here. Joni, make sure it's a question. <laughs> it is. There are three little ones. The yeah. first is you talked about um, uh, pot. And most of us think that the TCH is the one that is addicting and that CBDs are not. Are you saying that it's all addicting, CBDs too? Yeah, that's a good, too? yeah, thank you. That's a good point. That's so a, um, marijuana, of course, is not a medicine. Right? It's got a lot of actives, and we don't really know all the actives yet. And uh, the metabolites that are formed in our body of the actives, but the two big classes, of course, are cannabidiol and then delta 9 THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. And what gets you high is tetrahydrocannabinol. All right, that's what binds to the CB1 receptor. And so um, there is some evidence that there's. Uh, that cannabidiol and, and THC work together in a way synergistically, that a little bit of THC and some cannabidiol will have, promote some of the more beneficial effects of cannabidiol, and cannabidiol does have beneficial effects um, for inflammation and other disorders. I mean, uh, uh, epilepsy in children. I mean, these are, are, are th this would be developing these for real medicines that would be standardized and packaged in a way like we but would think of. But is that addicting? Is it cannabidiol is CB, addicting? The CBD. Not is, to our knowledge, no. Okay, no, no. great. You're, you're right. Okay, great. Second quick question is you talked about light therapy. And um, is that the, like the infrared yeah, therapy? Yeah, I was curious about that too. And I wanted to know if they have a place here where it helps with inflammation. They say if you had cancer, you shouldn't do it. Other people say, it's perfectly fine, but it's good for inflammation. Like and, but does it kill the good bacteria or the good viruses? Or does it make you too susceptible that if you do it because it feels good, um, you won't be able to do it later if you really need it? Right. That's a great question. So the, the light therapy I'm talking about is not commercially available um, right now. So it's a... It's a it's a specific wavelength range that, it, that is not available right now. It really wouldn't penetrate deeper than the very superficial skin layers. Um, so, so really, when we think about this, um, in terms of breaking that cycle of colonization leading to opportunistic infection, you could <coughs> potentially use this repeatedly 
on an individual who's colonized with specific bacteria like MRSA or Candida auris. Um, you could also use it to decontaminate a room because light's just going to get into the crevices better than someone just scrubbing um, surfaces and missing different components of it. So, so in my mind, you know, the use of light really opens up a lot of opportunity. Okay. Good question. So for Canada albicans, so so just to say it, other than Canada oris, because we don't understand it, all the other Candida species, they're commensals, meaning we have a peace treaty with them. And so in most of our guts right now, we all carry Canada albicans. And if you do an experiment and try to get rid of it, you actually could end up with health problems. So it's a good fungus, you know? So we, we don't want to get rid of it. Um, so oris. Good question. I, I'd, I'd get rid of that, but there's others that clearly provide benefit. Good question. Other question. Very For good. Dr. Mash? Um, you had mentioned that there's um, permanent, well, you mentioned that, that ibucane obvious, obviously helps with people in active addiction. You also mentioned that there's permanent changes to the brain genetic structure for people who are in addiction. So first of all, what happens for people who are in recovery, who've had those permanent changes? Does ibocaine actually help it's a them? a great question. And what about also then, if you define addiction a bit more broadly, mm -hmm. that everyone really has compulsions, um, does that really help other, like every subject, every, every human being? Yeah, those are two very fundamental questions. The you know, the, the neuroplasticity, so the, the epigenetic changes to the brain are long-lasting and we think enduring. Do we know that for sure? We really don't because epigenetic profiling in, in brain, in human, is a brand new science, so we really don't know the answer to that. Um, we do know that epigenetic changes are handed down, and you can do that experiment in, in animals with, you know, obese mother rats who give birth to little rats who then become obese. So you can look at those and track those across generations. So, but remember, genetics is not destiny, right? And so if you have other behavioral modifiers, then, you know, we all carry risk alleles, right? We all have, you know, genes in our family for one thing or another. Um, and many of us are not affected. Even though, you know, obviously the best thing is not to be exposed to the drug in the first place. Because if you carry the risk and you're not exposed, you're okay. You can go through life, you'll be fine. So they, my answer is we don't yet know. Um, but I think that the, what's important is to allow the brain to get back to what we would call a pre-addicted state. And the Ibogaine and perhaps the Noribogaine 2 is going to not only have these effects on the molecular targets I talk about, but also they turn on some growth factors and things. And I think the number, the longer you're off the drugs, remember in AANA, at 90 days, that chip is red. And that's a big point for relapse. You know, that's empirical. We know this. Well, if you look at functional MRI or you do PET scans on the brain, you see the brain kind of, you know, starting, these neuroadaptations are occurring. So I, the hope here, the hope, is that the Ibogaine treatment, that therapy, will have the neurochemical reset and perhaps resetting other factors in the brain and maybe even at a DNA level, which we know nothing about, and it'll give you extend the window so that the brain can heal over time. So you're healing the addicted brain and you're healing the inner wounds and the trauma that got you into the cycle to begin with. Question over Thank here. You Um, I enjoyed all the speakers. You were wonderful. I just want to ask you um, several questions. One about growth hormones. Oh, you can, okay. Growth hormones that so many children are taking today at 12 years old. I was wondering if one of you could address that. Yeah, I, I am not an expert in growth hormone in, in children. I, I'm just from basic medicine. I, there's a definite recognition that, you know, certain disorders do need to be treated with um, adjunctive additional growth hormone injections and under the care of a 
pediatric endocrinologist, you know, that should be monitored and performed safely. Um, but I'm, I, think, I think part of what's being questioned is the fact that here in Aspen, we have the ability to be overwhelmed by new therapies that have not been tested. <clears throat> and I suspect there are a number of people in the audience who take HCG and human growth hormone based on no data whatsoever, but somebody said this will keep you from getting cancer or from aging. In fact, human growth hormone can stimulate cancers to grow just from the growth of that hormone. Yeah. Uh, that's probably where it's coming from. But thank you for that answer. Next question, please. Can I make a comment about that? Just yes, Because I'm a chemist in the crowd, right? So <laughs> I am astonished that people are willing to play games with this complicated, nonlinear set of coupled equations that determines your biochemistry. And with respect to marijuana, for example, if, if I give you a five milligram tablet of oxycodone, I know exactly what's in it and so does your physician. And they know how it's metabolized by most bodies and they can track it. If you smoke a joint, depending on where it came from, how hot the embers were when you inhaled, and all the rest of it, you're doing an experiment on yourself. And while some of these things may not be addictive and may even be beneficial, doing such an uncontrolled experiment, I think is, in my opinion, unwise, even though I'm not a doctor, right? And I'd say the same thing about human growth hormone or any other molecular chemistry that you're trying to do. I've spent my whole life studying chemistry. It's wicked complicated. And so doing an experiment on myself is something that I do only very, very cautiously. And I agree with Michael's assessment that if you need growth hormone or some other compound, it's best to do it under the care of a physician who understands that chemistry and can prevent you from killing yourself or causing harm. Can I say one thing? Please. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, I, I hope what we've told you, and you've been a fantastic audience, is that there's, you know, there's risks in life, and there's, you know, we're, we're trying to find solutions for those, for those problems. Um, but, you know, we, I'm acutely aware that there are people out there who really want to try things because they want to improve their health, and I, I think it's, you know, there's true motivation behind those behaviors. So, you know, I, I can say things, like one, please wash your hands, and I would say enjoy life and enjoy Aspen and your environment and where you live, and don't, and don't be afraid, and sushi. Thank you, sushi in the back. Like, don't be, a, you know, I mean, I enjoy them. And, you know, it's not about fear of your environment. Um, and I can also tell you that when you smoke marijuana, you know, it's loaded with mold spores. I can just, you know, and so to the point that I can tell you if, when I have a solid organ transplant patient, someone who just had a kidney transplant performed, and they come to me and say, oh, well, this has been great. I'm off dialysis. It's a new chapter of life. And I'll say, great, you know, travel, do anything you want. Um, when you travel, uh, just make sure you talk to us so we can tell you about the pathogens um, in the cave in Puerto Rico before you go in so you don't get exposed to things. Um, if you want to smoke marijuana, you know what? Bake it first because it reduces the, the spore load so you don't get invasive aspergillus in your lung because your immune system's weakened. So, I mean, I think it's really, it's all about understanding the motivation behind that patient if we are willing to take that risk because we see potential benefit let's at least find a way to make it as safe as possible yeah you know, it's it's so incredibly important what what you've just covered this community is full of people we call the worried well <laughs> we're healthy but we wish to keep being healthy so I read here that if I take this every day, it's going to help me live longer. And I read here online, you know, we're inundated with this online crap, if you would. And we wind up following this stuff. So what you're giving here is a, a very important warning and heads up. You're playing with your own health with a lot of these situations. Next question. Dr. Beaton. Thank you, Alan. I'm interested in this field of epigenetics. You used as an example a mouse that becomes obese and it gives, it gives birth to uh, mice that later become obese. 
Um, I'm interested in, uh, that seems to me it means that heritable traits or, or acquired traits are heritable to some extent. Exactly. What does that say then about the field of evolutionary biology? Is there an, another whole mechanism besides natural selection at work? Well, you know, the, the, I think we're learning a lot, and I don't think we know the answer to that question. I mean, obviously, there is an interaction between gene and environment. You get that. The point of the epigenetics or the, or the chromatin remodeling versus methylation marks that are going through the DNA, we're just, that's the next layer that we're just beginning to discern. And how this scales to the, ex, the exascale yeah. biology, which he knows something about being a DARPA ARAPA person and very smart that I don't know, but the folks at Oak Ridge National Labs and other places who are looking at the big data sciences at this mega scale are the ones that are gonna try to figure out those rules and that. From a neuroscience perspective, I mean, we're just, we are just literally scratching the surface. We're at a, such a simplistic empirical place right now looking at, you know, clusters of, of genes that are being silenced or activated, what does it mean, you know, what pathways are being activated, so we're nowhere near your idea. That's a bad answer, but that's what I got. But you're not ruling it out. You want to answer that? Well, no, I, I'll just add to that maybe, or supplement it in the following, because I'm not an expert in this area, but um, essentially what happened is when we had the Human Genome Project, the public was sold this idea that if we understood that one-dimensional sequence of A, C's, G's, and T's, that we would solve the, the riddles of human biology. And what ended up happening, and like Rich Roberts at New England Biolabs and others have been studying this for some time now, and I think with great effect, is that not only the methylation patterns on the DNA, but how it's folded and how it interacts with the proteins and the other things in its environment all have an influence on how that gene expresses itself by making or not making proteins. And e even when it comes down to a protein, if there are n atoms in a molecule, in proteins there can be thousands of atoms, there are three times that number minus six degrees of rotational and vibrational freedom. So if you imagine this as a bunch of springs and balls connected together like you had when you were in high school chemistry, there are lots of different ways of folding that thing, and they can have completely different biochemical consequences. So the cynical way I describe epigenetics is all the genetic information that we missed on the first pass with the Human Genome Project. I hope that helps. No, I agree with you. And Good I, answers. And I, Thank you. And I, I, and I agree completely. We, lots of examples are coming out that support epigenetics as another mechanism um, where imprinting and other uh, forms of of, trans, of genetic transmission can occur. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing, it's, it's wonderful, and we, we just really, we really need to do a lot more to study these mechanisms. Mm -hmm. And of course, the big data people, as, and the AI and the machine learning, the deep learning, is gonna be the next. They're, they're gonna try. They're gonna try. Let's not let them oversell us, is my advice, right? I have two questions. Um, I regrettably ended up getting MRSA between breast cancer surgeries, and so I have to get a Vanco drip every time I go in for any procedure, and I travel Ouch. with Zyvox just in case of emergency. So my first question is, what's the chance of reoccurrence? Because um, I heard that you can, you have a more likelihood to get it again. And so what's the likelihood of reoccurrence if I, you know, fall and scrape my knee or have something? And is there anything else I can be doing um, in that case? And then the other question for Dr. Mash is, um, I understand that ayahuasca also has similar uh, properties to Ibogen for recovery and helping you heal and uh, against, um, I guess, reversing the effects of addiction. So I was just curious to know what the difference is between sure. those two. You start with the MRSA. I want to hear this answer too. I have to be concerned about holding the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Don't lick it. <laughs> Woo hoo! MRSA. Sorry, sorry about your MRSA infection. Um, I, I think let's just go with a first principle. You know, if you're healthy, you know most of these resistant bacteria and fungi, including Candida auris, 
will not cause you a problem because you have the best defense system, which is your own immune system. So as long as and we don't have to do anything special to keep that healthy, you know, I mean, I'm talking balanced diet. I mean, w there's no need to do anything extraordinary to keep yourself healthy. Um, so if you're healthy, that really shouldn't be a problem. But let's say you fall into one of those scenarios. Uh, you scrape your knee or you need to have a procedure done. You are now aware that you have MRSA on your skin. Um, we've tried for years to use antibiotics and soaps and detergents to like remove that off the skin. It works for a short period of time and we know it comes right back. Um, I probably have MRSA just from working in the hospital. Um, it just means you need to be aware, and you've already named like, the two most common antibiotics you would need to have for you at the time of those procedures. So can it relapse? Mm. Yes. Uh, but you now know that, and you are, you know, in the event that you need to have those procedures done, you use those two antibiotics, and you should be great. Ayahuasca, real quick, is a brew that comes out of South America and Brazil. There were two churches, Santo Daim and uh, the UDV, the Union of the Vegetables. Um, it's a combination. It's a brew that was used historically, which contains dimethyltryptamine and uh, Banisteriopsis, which is a beta carboline. Uh, my laboratory, I published in this. I was in the church in Brazil. I wouldn't drink that stuff. I was right there. We talk about spores and things, and oh, God help us with that stuff. And of course, they're bringing ayahuasca into the United States, and they're having all these ayahuasca ceremonies and everything else. Does it help addiction? When I was in the church in Brazil, they, they would go once a month to take it, and they had told me that they saw some beneficial effects for um, Alcoholism, which is interesting because the carbolines, the harmala alkaloids, have actually, there's some indication that they could be developed. Do I think there's any real evidence to suggest that this is going to help get people off of drugs? No, I don't. One more question. Then after this question, <coughs> excuse me, uh, our speakers are going to be up front. You can confront, I'm sorry, you can question them. <laughs> uh, uh, after this question, but I really want to say you've heard three incredible experts. We hear about the brain. We hear about addiction. We've been told about a new medication, the fascinating way it was discovered by the expert who discovered it. We've been told about the concern of superbugs, which is, has an impact on all of us. You sitting right here, he up there. And what is the potential future for that and the concerns about it? And then, of course, from our brainiac, we hear about machines that play with each other, not in the way that we think about that. That is really fascinating. <laughs> and, and, we're, and we're getting some idea of where this might go. So just before we take that last question, I really want to thank the three of you. And most of all, to well thank Steve Gorlin and Debbie Gorlin and the Gorlin Companies for bringing it. And I also want to let you know two things. Number one, there are a lot of people who are not here who'd be interested in this. The videotape of this will be on the Aspen Chabad JCC site, so you can re-watch it. And maybe you all, or some of you, might want to write a letter to the Aspen Times or the Aspen Daily News and ask them, why the hell didn't you cover this incredibly interesting event? Because somehow, they only cover stuff that has to do with marijuana ads, or they cover stuff that has to do with somebody who's putting a duck in the water and all these important things, but somehow if it's not at the Institute, it doesn't get covered. You might want to ask them about that. Last question, please. Um, first of all, may I say that thank you for sharing your incredible gift of knowledge. Thank you. Closer all to your mouth. Well, thank you for sharing your, your wonderful gift of knowledge with us. Uh, I know I'm deeply grateful. Question for Dr. Mash and then the others too. 
hard life, practical situation. You happen to be a, a grandparent of five or six wonderful young grandchildren. You have a family member who smokes marijuana, who also loves those grandchildren. What are the rules that you're willing to put in place to protect the grandchildren? <laughs> That's a, so, the, so the question is, you know, it, it's about, there's multi-levels to this question. One, it's um, exposure risk. Um, you know, I, I don't want it around. Uh, if you're going to use it, you know, I, I don't like being an example to children, right? I, I worry about that because if you see, it's just like alcohol, you know, you see mommy and daddy, you know, drinking, then you get curious, you want to try it and whatnot. And of course, it's hard not to be exposed to it now because it's so everywhere, and I mean everywhere. Um, but I think the families need to, you need to be frank about this. You know, you need to have conversations with children and you don't want to, you know, you, my mother was very worried about me smoking marijuana a long time ago. Okay, and she used to search my room every day when I was in high school looking for marijuana. I don't know why she, I was an honors student. I'm not sure why she really thought I had marijuana in the house, but I guess what I did. Okay, I bought some, and my mother found it, and she threw it away. You know, she was very keen on throwing it away. Um, thank goodness for me, I didn't, never smoked a lot, and when I got to college, I thought it made you stupid, so I quit. I think having a strong family you know, having my love of my family, having people who cared about me and didn't want me to get in harm's way. And that all of that was a factor in my decision making as a young person. So I think the strong family unit is the best defense we have to protect young people from addiction. Now, the, the subtle message that it's safe and don't worry about it you know, it's the experiment. You're doing the experiment. And I think we have to be real about that. We have to be genuine and say, alcohol causes problems. And if you're smoking, you know, high, high potency marijuana every day, we don't know. We don't know what that's going to have an effect on the, on the brain in terms of memory, risk for Alzheimer's. I mean, we don't know. We, don't, we simply do not know. Go ahead. I just have a comment. So both my parents smoked heavily while I was growing up, and I never had informed consent. They died of cancer. And I think that in retrospect, if when, when, when I raise my children, and if I have grandchildren, for me, the key is to provide informed consent. And it's very difficult to inform a very young person. Yes. So that leaves the responsibility, in my view, on the parents. Yes not to expose people to, to things that have the potential to cause harm. I agree. Um, but that's just my two cents. I'm not an expert. I'm not even a qualified physician. So take it for what it's worth. It's a good way to, it's a good way to, to pose the issue, though. Mm -hmm. Information and informed consent and being the example and the exposure. That's perfect. Finally, finally, I would sincerely like to thank, and we should all give a very large round of applause to Justin Lupau for putting all this together. Thank you all very much.